happy Sunday morning and welcome to Worship Heritage Fellowship's family and friends. As we prepare our hearts for today's praise, worship, and message, I ask that you join me in a moment of prayer. Dear mighty and merciful God, we have seen you calm the storms. God, we have seen you make a way when we could not see a way. We thank you for the prayers of all our foremothers and fathers. Lord, we thank you for the work they've put in that we may stand here today. We ask that you allow us to be conduits of your love and grace and mercy and be blessings to those around us. Lord, help us to reach someone who has yet to know you and let our lives be a living testimony of your greatness. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. A few weeks back, Pastor Sullivan preached on being delivered into the promise. And as we celebrate the 42nd anniversary of our church, I think we can all agree that we have truly been delivered into the promise. Our church house, our people, our ministries and outreach, even our technology has been blessed to grow. Today, we honor the founders of our church and the many willing workers who have invested their love, time, talents and gifts into this body of Christ. They have set a high bar, and guess what? We can't stop, because to those who much is given, much is required. And we have been given a strong spiritual foundation, a beautiful edifice, and an abundance of talents and resources. So on this anniversary Sunday, I've come to remind you and me that we've got to roll up our sleeves and get to work. Proverbs 16 and three says, commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established. That means if you want to shift your outlook, you must increase your output. Let's focus on increasing our prayer time and our dedicated service to God and watch all the good things that will continue to flow from God, amen. Let's stay connected. Each week during our virtual worship experience, you can interact with us at 7.45 a.m. on YouTube live chat and at 10.45 a.m. during the Facebook watch party. Also, visit our website, heritagereston.org for previous messages and other important announcements. Heritage, it is time to bless the Lord with our tithes and offerings. We are all aware of the economic strain being felt across the world and we pray diligently for the families negatively impacted. But thanks be to God, many of us have been blessed to retain our jobs, even see promotion and increase in this time. Luke 12, 48 declares that for everyone to whom much is given, much from them will be required. In these unprecedented times, we pray that you will search your hearts and give as the spirit leads. There are multiple ways to give on our homepage, Click Give in the upper right hand corner and use the Secure Give app or text to give by sending love lifts and your dollar amount to 703-337-3347. You may also give through automated banking and by mailing your check to the church. We thank you in advance for your gifts of love. Each holiday season, the Heritage family participates in the Angel Gift Tag program, which provides Christmas gifts for children in need. Due to COVID-19, we have had to shift the program a bit, but we still need your support. This year, we will purchase and distribute gift cards to local families. To donate, please access Secure Give and select Angel Tree Gift. You may also send contributions by check or cash to the church. The need is great, but our God is greater, and we are excited to bless the children. Please submit your donations by November 30th and thank you in advance for your gifts of love. When I was growing up in church, the saints used to march into worship every Sunday morning singing the same song. We've come this far, you know it, by faith. Leaning on the Lord, trusting in His Holy Word, for He has never failed us yet. Oh, 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 oh can't turn around. We've come this far by faith. 
That's the song that rings in my heart as we celebrate this 42nd anniversary. And this morning we want to do things just a little bit different, but I would pause as we celebrate to ask you, beloved, ask you Heritage Fellowship Church to join me in honoring and recognizing the former shepherd of this house, our pastor emeritus, Reverend Dr. Norman Tate. Dr. Tate, Pastor Tate has meant so many things to so many people. And in this season of pandemic, I would that you just take a moment as we celebrate God for his faithfulness in this place, to take the time to pin a note of appreciation of gratitude. It always feels good when somebody checks in on you. If you will join me in that, in that celebration, in that recognition of sending in cards of recognition and gratitude, send them here to Heritage Fellowship Church. We'll compile them, we'll get them uh, to, to the Tate family. And my, I believe it'll be a blessing as they sit in their quiet time to be able to open up and to receive the love that comes from a grateful people. So I invite you this morning to join in with me to celebrate the blessings that God has given us. And as we celebrate those blessings, uh, it is my privilege to uh, present this Sunday morning prayer, an anniversary prayer, being led by our deacon in care, Sister Barbara Osborne Harris. Sister Barbara Osborne Harris is beloved of this congregation and has a prayer the Lord has laid on her heart for God's people that as we continue to journey forward in faith, we will not forget a God that has brought us thus far on the way. Receive her even now. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, God who has brought us thus far on the way, eternal and almighty God, maker, creator, sustainer of all life, giver of the good and perfect gift, Jesus. Oh God, we come to you this morning, hearts humbled, spirits filled with hope and praise, because you woke us up this morning. You woke us up, Lord, and we are clothed in our right mind. A mind, O oh, Heavenly Father, that allows us to come to you first before we start this day. For we know, O oh Lord, there is nothing we can do without your presence. And O oh God, we just want to walk into your presence right now. We know, Lord, that you are all around us, but very often we don't walk into your presence. We stay to ourselves, O oh Lord. And right now, O oh Lord, we want to just walk into your presence and feel the peace that you provide to us. The peace, O oh Lord, that surpasses all understanding. O oh, Heavenly Father, this day we thank you for providing us with a foundation we did not set. We thank you, O oh Heavenly Father, for giving us wells we did not dig, and food and provision, O oh Lord, where we neither toiled or labored. We just give you thanks, Heavenly Father. We can't say it enough. We just thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, Heavenly Father, your people right now are looking at the world around us. We're looking at our own lives also, and we're trying to figure out what is going on. We're not allowing ourselves, oh Lord, to lean to you and not to our own understanding. For if we search your word, Lord, it says that there is nothing new under the sun. That life is lived in seasons. And oh Lord, your people right now are in a season that is so unknown to us as we walk. But as we remember, oh Lord, and we search your word, we know, Heavenly Father, that years and years ago, you asked folk 
to recount the miracles that you provide when your people are up against the wall. And oh Lord, we just recount that. And your word tells us too that when the children shall ask, meaning the children will ask. And right now we're among children who asked the question, but the elders did not answer. Oh Lord, please forgive us. Forgive us for not answering the question. Forgive us, O oh Heavenly Father, for forgetting all that you have done to us in previous seasons. Hatred and bigotry and prejudice is not new. Oppression is not new, O oh Lord. But see, Lord, we have forgotten to answer the question. We need to allow our children to know that there is nothing impossible with you. We need to allow them to know that this is not the first Red Sea. This is not the first Pharaoh, oh Lord. We are not the first oppressed people. Oh Heavenly Father, open our minds and our spirits and our hearts to think about the stories presented in your word, to think about our own personal stories in our families, let us, Lord, speak boldly to talk about who you are and what you do. Oh, Heavenly Father, right now, I'm reflecting on that perfect gift of Jesus Christ, where you showed us what it is to love, what it is to sacrifice. You gave your only son for the forgiveness of sin. And you ask, oh, Heavenly Father, that we just believe it. We just believe on your word that you gave your son for the sins of the world. And if we believe, Heavenly Father, that Jesus Christ is truly your son, that he was your sacrifice for our sins, sins before we even got here, Lord, because you know the nature of humankind. We have to believe, O oh, Heavenly Father, that he walked this earth. He, O oh, Heavenly Father, performed miracles and he healed both physical illness and mental illness. And Lord, we know right now we need a healing in terms of mental illness. We just need to believe it, O oh, Lord. And we need to also understand that his healing was for your glory and for your edification and not for ours. We need to understand that you sent him into the world, not to condemn the world, but through him the world might be saved. And yet, O oh Lord, your people, and some, O oh Heavenly Father, who claim to profess you, are condemning. O oh Heavenly Father, just forgive us for our own condemnation of your children. Forgive us, O oh Heavenly Father, for thinking in ways that are not pleasing in your sight, for acting in ways, O oh Lord, that are displeasing and that dishonor your love and your gift of your Son. O oh Heavenly Father, we need you. No different than people who needed you years, years, and years ago. And as we think about the peculiar pilgrimage of people, O oh Lord, who have suffered oppression. When we think about it, Heavenly Father, we know that we must turn to you because you are the answer. Heavenly Father, we can look in our own history we look at the history of this country and we're able to see, O oh Lord, how you have moved in spite of the evil. We can see it, O oh Lord. 
We can look into our own lives. We can remember a praying grandmother. We can remember other saints, O oh Lord, who put their own lives on the line as they heard your voice to tell them to move into ways that were really uncomfortable, but served the greater good. Oh Lord, we know folks, oh Heavenly Father, who understood if they just have the faith of a grain of a mustard seed, they can tell that mountain to move. See, Lord, you're not asking us to climb those mountains, you're asking us by faith to hold that mustard seed and believe and you will move the mountain. Oh Lord, we need more energy. We need the spirit of the saints of old to speak to our hearts, to speak to our minds. We need to understand, oh Lord, that it's not about us, it's about you. And your word tells us that this fight is not flesh and blood. It's spiritual. Your spirit of good against the spirit of evil. Oh, Heavenly Father, move in ways you've never moved before. We need to hear a word from you so that we can be your light. Oh, Lord, forgive us when we take that light and we hide it under a bushel. Oh, loving and kind and forgiving God. We know that we need you. Your children are calling out. We have to be your instruments once again. Oh, Heavenly Father, as I recount the Samaritan woman, a woman shunned in a culture, despised by many. But Jesus, O oh Lord, walked up to her when others wouldn't. And it was based on her word because of her experience and being in his presence that changed her life and gave her bold witness. And Lord, as we walk into places where your spirit dwells, we too need bold, bold faith to speak truth to power, knowing that is not our voice, that we are just vessels. We have to present ourselves as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing unto you so that you can use us. Use this vessel for your purpose, for your glory, and for your edification. We're not worried right now because we know you got us. You've always had us and you always will. We will trust, O oh Lord, in you. We will trust, O oh Lord, in you. We will trust, O oh Lord, in you. And we just thank you, Lord, for the elders who raised their voices to bring remembrance to the young. Not only those they can see, we have to tell the story of how you parted the Red Sea. We have to tell the story how you held back the waters in the Jordan. We have to tell the story about the man who regained his sight. We have to tell the story about the raising of the dead. We have to tell the story of your spirit within people who were called by your name who humbled themselves and they prayed for the healing of the land. We have to tell the story. We have to be a part of that story. Oh, Heavenly Father, right now, I'm just gonna do something personal. I thank you for my father, for a father whose life was parallel to what Jesus talked about, who said, that we should look at our earthly fathers. And if we look at an earthly father who provides for us, why wouldn't a heavenly father do? 
Oh Lord, my father gave his life to Christ so that I could have the example and the belief of a heavenly father because I had an earthly father who mirrored the characteristics. I had a grandmother who talked to me about wrestling with the angels, wrestling with God until she got blessed. Her story that I had to share and remind my mother and my aunts prior to their transition, just wrestle. Think about the goodness of God, not only in their lives, but in the lives of all those who came before. We have a responsibility, we have a story. We've already won. Let us walk on into our victory, knowing that God got us. He's always had us. He has us. His spirit within us is greater than all of the spirits outside of us. Let us boldly and with confidence and with faith walk into the presence of God, that God can be victorious through his people. We humbly submit our prayer, knowing that when we get off of our knees, it is answered. To God be the glory, to God be the praise. Oh, Heavenly Father, give us what we need to pull this generation through and to pull generations we have yet to see. This is our prayer that we pray humbly in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord and our Savior. Amen, amen, and amen. Well, praise God. Heritage, I'm so grateful that you have included me in this year's 42nd anniversary. The Lord has been good, has he not? Whereof we are glad. In this age of uncertainty, where it seems that every day we're given a new and living challenge, the church, church must reach out to those who are not just within, but without on the perimeter of the church, so that they might understand the power and wonder of God. I would then say to you that during this anniversary and beyond. Let's keep walking together, uh, working together, worshiping together, and then see the will of God done among us. God bless you, and may heaven smile upon you. Heritage started as a very small church. We met in people's homes. Then we moved to the Southgate Community Center. When we outgrew that, we moved to the Reston Community Center. We found a plot of land on Fox Mill Road where we built a small church. That church served us well, but as we continued to grow, we found that we had to blow out the windows every Sunday so that people could sit out on a deck and hear the services. That worked very well until winter time. We then built an annex. The annex housed our Sunday school, which before then had been on the back rows of the church. As we continued to grow, we would have worship services 745 here in the building and 1045, we met at South Lakes High School. We decided to begin 
a building here. We tore down the small church and moved to what we call Temporary Temple, which was located in an office building in Herndon, Virginia. One thing we learned during this time is that the church is not the brick and mortar. The church is the people of the community. I want to take this time to thank the great spiritual leaders that we've had down through the years who have made me who I am today. I want to talk about Reverend Dancy. Some of you know who he is. Reverend Mays, Larry Evans, Deborah McGill. What about Reverend Dr. Bishop and Pastor Norman A. Tate and now Pastor Dustin Sullivan? All of you have a special place in my heart, and I praise God for you. Uh, I've been a member since 1984, which makes that 17 plus 20, 37 years. One thing that's been steady in my life is heritage. Uh, many of you remember my son, Yusef, and Hassan, and again, this is the one steady thing that I've had in my life. And, uh, you know, I love my church, always did. And anybody who knows me for a while, they know me very well. I'm very proud that during our years of service, we have had a great connection with the community. The motto of the community outreach is that we should go in and feed the hungry clothe the naked, visit those who are imprisoned. We have also attempted to do the Great Commission to go and disciple others. We started off very humbly, and I just look at this place now and I say, look at God. Thank you, Lord. Great is thy faithfulness. As you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. I pray on this morning that there would be no accident or incident, that God, you would protect us and keep us safe as we unload these trucks. God, we pray that as we do so, that we do so with the spirit of Christ and that our hearts would be filled with your joy, God, that somebody might come to know you, come to know your love, come to see and answer prayer, oh God, in the way in which you bless our hands and bless our hearts to be of service to ministry. On this morning, God, we ask, God, that you would just use this moment, Lord, to transform us. There's so much hate in our world, so much division in our world, God. We pray even through the sharing of food, God, that you would allow us to share your peace and your love. So God, on today, we ask not only a blessing on those that have gathered to, to distribute food, God, we ask a blessing over the homes of those, oh God, who will receive this food. Lord, let it be a blessing, not only about food, but of how, God, you see us wherever we are, and you still, God, provide for us. So God, to your name be the glory, to your name be the honor, to your name be the praise. We do this work in celebration of Jesus, and for his name we do pray, amen. 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 amen.
Now, let's worship with the praise team and make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Praise the Lord, saints. Somebody say hallelujah to God. We give you glory and honor and praise, oh God, as we celebrate another church anniversary. Our God is faithful, amen? Amen. We will continue to believe in you and trust in you, oh God. I know that faith is easy when everything is going well. But can you still believe in me when your life's not going well? Oh, no. And when all the things around you seem to quickly fade. There's just one thing I really need to know. Will you let go? I'll trust you, Lord. Will you stand on my word? I'll trust you, Lord. Against all odds, will you believe what I have said? Oh, I'll trust you. I'll trust you, Lord. Will you believe? I'll trust you, Lord. Every promise that I made, will you receive? Yes, I will trust you, Lord. When everything is going well, oh yes, but can you still believe in me when your life's not going well, oh my, and when all the things around you seem to quickly fade away, there's just one thing.
Good Sunday morning. We have come into his house, gathered in his name, to worship Christ the Lord. This Sunday morning, we greet you with the joy of Jesus, which is in fact our strength, and grateful that we have reasons to celebrate. One of those reasons, beloved, is our 42nd anniversary. Come on, beloved. Let's worship God even now for bringing us safely through 42 years of ministry, 42 years of being a witness, 42 years of spreading the gospel, 42 years of being a beacon of light and hope to a world that is searching for Christ. On this Sunday morning, I am so delighted to stand before you to have the blessed privilege uh, to present to you a brother beloved unto me, one that I have known, one that stretches me to grow in the practice and in the gifts that God has given me none other than the esteemed Dr. Joseph Evans. Dr. Joseph Evans is a name that each of us should know. Dr. Evans is the Dean of the Morehouse School of Religion in Atlanta, Georgia. Dr. Evans is a well-seasoned voice of the gospel. He is a former pastor. He is a former adjunct professor at both Howard and Wesley. Dr. Evans is an esteemed voice, a prophet of our times. And this Sunday morning, he has come, he has graciously accepted the invitation to be our 42nd church anniversary speaker. So on this morning, I pray that wherever you are, that you get in your seat of readiness, that you open your ears, that you tune down the noise around you, that we lean into the faith together as we await a word that has come from on high. On this Sunday morning, we invite you even now, won't you please pray with me? Our Father and our God, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for this 42nd year of ministry. We thank you, God, for the women and the men, named and unnamed, the under shepherds, O oh God, who faithfully guided your people in their quest to serve you. On this Sunday morning, there's some names, O oh God, who ring loud in our hearts as we remember the tradition, as we remember the journey of faith that you brought us on. And so, God, we lift them even now to your hearing, O oh God, to celebrate and to give glory, honor, and praise for what you have done through this body of believers here in Reston, Virginia. God, in no small part, the work that you've been able to do has been entrusted into the hands, O oh God, of under shepherds. And this morning we'd be remiss if we did not call aloud the name of our pastor emeritus, Dr. Norman Tate, Lord Jesus. And thank you, God, for the gift of ministry. Thanking you, God, for the faithfulness of how he served you, O oh God, and how, O oh God, men and women gave their lives and their hands and their hearts, Lord Jesus, to grow this body of faith. Lord, on this Sunday morning, Building on a firm foundation, we stand. And in expectancy and excitement for what you are yet still doing, we offer you our praise as we, we lift worship to your name. To your name alone, O oh God, be the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Listen, it is my privilege to present to this congregation our guest preacher this Sunday morning none other than the Reverend Dr. Joseph Evans. Receive ye him.
The title of our anniversary sermon is The Politics of Bread. Turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 6, as we look together at the fourth miracle that Jesus performs before his people. And while you're finding your space there, in the word of the Lord, I want to thank you for this kind invitation to be a part of your 42nd year of church ministry. I'm equally thankful and appreciative of your pastor, Dr. Sullivan, who is very well prepared to pastor a church of this esteem through this generation. And I am certain that all of us are thanking God that he has prepared this young man to come into this space to lead us into uncharted territories. But if the church is to be the church, she will depend upon the Holy Spirit and the word of the Lord and the discernment of the preacher and the leadership to carry on in these uncertain times. And certainly to all of the members of this esteemed house, all of the officers and wayfarers who will come over these next years, God's blessings upon you. Now you've more than likely found your place in the Gospel of John, the chapter 6, and I shall read for you verse 10. Jesus said, Have the people sit down. The men numbered about 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves, and after giving thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also with the fish, as much as they wanted. Again, we're talking about the politics of bread. If you are a person who works in a diverse group of people or fellowship, perhaps you play bridge or others are in upholstery uh, 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 groups or uh, you are in knitting clubs. You, you have a diversity of people and in those groups you find out a lot about what people truly believe. Let me say to us here today that it is not our religion that reveals our politics, but it is our politics that reveals our religion. Either you believe in the abundance of resources, or you believe in the scarcity of resources, and if it's the latter, you have already demonstrated that you are on the side of empire. Jesus, our Lord, in this sixth chapter, has come out of the space of Capernaum, of Galilee. It was there that God in Christ revealed that he had miraculous, peculiar, unusual power. He uh, preached the gospel. He taught the gospel, but he also cast out demons. And people were attracted to the external person of Jesus. And so they followed him. They followed him out of Na the Nazareth or out of the region of Capernaum. And they followed him down the sea line of the Sea of Tiberias, like a serpentine line of people following what they may have thought of as a pied piper, as a drum major of justice. One can look up and see the seagulls and we get a pericope or a bird's eye view as we look down on these throngs of people following him. Their feet are touching upon that Palestinian chalky soil and the salt that was in the bracket water of the Sea of Galilee or the Sea of Tiberias bristled against the nostrils of their noses. And as the incline took place, as they walked there, breathing uh, began to become rapid. One could feel the pulsating of their hearts and the pulsating of their veins and their arteries as they made every effort to stay in contact with Jesus. And then a gentle incline. 
Jesus begins to walk upwardly into what appears to be a plateau of sorts. The writer gives us some indication that this is John's interpretation of what Matthew called the Sermon on the Mount. And there Jesus reveals his beatitudes and the ethical, poetic nature of God and how you and I should conduct ourselves in the kingdom of God upon the earth. Jesus then sets down. He sets in the position of a rabbi, one who has the uh, power and the authority to teach people. And there, Jesus looking over, he sees them approaching, and then he turns to his disciples and says to them in a very uh, direct and in an imperative way, where are we going to get the monies to feed the people? And they look at Jesus in an awkward fashion. They look at the throngs of people and they think of the monies that they have in their resources. Jesus knew what they were going to say, but he wanted to find out if they were catching up to who he really was and frankly who he is. And then the Lord, knowing what they would say, they said to him, we only have enough money here which is nothing more than a, maybe a couple of days' wages. It would not be enough to exchange for parcels or morsels of bread just to feed just a few of them. Now, Jesus was aware that these men who had followed him closely and intimately as his disciples, they had a politics of bread that said that they believed in the scarcity of resources and not in the abundance of resources. Jesus, from that alone, understood that his disciples were depending upon their flesh and not upon his spirit. And so Jesus, after interrogating and investigating their maturity in faith, one of his disciples said to him, Jesus... There's a laddie board here, a boy who has but a few barley loaves of bread and a few fishes. I suppose that you and I should identify with this lad because even though he is anonymous, I suppose he's really synonymous because majorities of us are not remembered because of our names. He makes clear that Ralph Ellison's invisible man was in existence prior to the writing of Ellison's word. No, this laddie boy, this nameless child, this person in the throngs of people is remembered in the lexicon of God, but not because of his name, rather because he had the resources. And Jesus says to him, you, disciple, I want you to get these barley loaves and fish from the young man and bring them to me. Jesus gets the parcels in his hands, and then all of us must be made aware that it was Passover. And although they were hungry and Jesus had compassion that he wanted to feed them, the Lord also knew that he must keep the Passover. You know, there are some blessings that we receive, not because of our individuality and not because we are somehow earnest and sincere and feel deserving of the blessings of God. Some reasons that we are blessed are primarily because Jesus keeps his word and keeps the Passover. And so the Lord blesses and breaks the elements and he gives them back to his disciples. In other words, he redistributes the wealth and gives it to his disciples. Jesus keeps Passover. He blesses it, he breaks it, and he gives it unto his disciples. And let us hurry to say, isn't it significant that in your 42nd year, you and I may have a close proximity and even a relationship with Jesus. We have Jesus, but we may not have the resources. The little boy had the resources, but didn't necessarily have a relationship with Jesus. Doesn't it make sense to the 21st century church 
that we go out and find those little laddie boys and those little laddie girls with the resources and introduce them to Jesus so that the church will have the socially marginalized genius on the margins as a part of the body of Christ. Jesus introduces to us this 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 opportunity, this 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 opportunity, this this obligation that we must go out into the highways and byways of the proximities of our local congregations and find the next lad and the next lass. Lord blesses it and he breaks it and he gives it unto his disciples. But why is it that Jesus has chosen to do his fourth miracle there? It appears that he's somewhere near the Sea of Tiberias on the northwest side of the Sea of Tiberias. It seems to be a non-unsignificant place, but it was there that Jesus performs his miracle. And why is it that John the writer does not call it the Sea of Tiberias? of Galilee or the Lake Genezareth. Only a couple of times in all of the New Testament it is called the Sea of Tiberias. It appears that our Lord is signifying. The Lord has created a living metaphor, a language of the oppressed, to speak to the hegemonic power of Tiberius Caesar, who had the audacity to change the name of the Sea of Galilee or the Lake Genezaret, and through his, 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 his large and uncontrollable narcissistic ego, <laughs> he decides that that which had belonged to a people group for generations, he would put his name on it. But more importantly, we know that the Roman Empire had taken from the people their land. And by taking their land, they were made sharecroppers on their own land. And they would take the barley and then they would grind it. And uh, they would separate the wheat from the chaff. And then they would uh, take the wheat and turn it into flour and the flour baked in ovens and made into bread. But that bread was sent, if you will, to Rome and the Roman economy and exchanger uh, put on it a value and they sold the bread back to the farmer who had produced it and marked up the price where the farmer who had prepared and toiled on the land and had used his and her skill sets uh, to create a market, they were subjugated by the exchange and they were exploited. And Jesus uses this opportunity as if to say unto empire that God had his eye on you and that God understood and, and had empathy and sympathy on the people. Jesus had used the miracle to unfold the secret to the kingdom of God upon the earth that would eventually usurp all kingdoms of empire upon the earth. God in Christ had used this privilege and this miracle, this living metaphor of miracle uh, to elevate the power of God above all powers of the earth. And we see Jesus here demonstrating to the people that if you participate in the miracle, that God will make a way out of no way. Yes, it is Passover, the Lord. Uh, he took the bread and he, he blessed it. <laughs> and he broke it. But he gave it on to his disciples. And somehow 
in the act of participation where the boy was willing to share his resources and put them into the hands of the Lord Jesus. And somewhere in between when the Lord blesses it and breaks it, the miracle of transformation begins to take place. Sit down, sit down, sit down in the field and cooperate. Sit down and let your anxieties decrease. And while you and I are doing that, God is doing a miracle in our midst. I don't know what the miracle will be at this church over the next seven months. But if you just sit down and trust God that the Lord will raise up resources for you that inevitably you would have never had. Just sit down and listen to the voice of God. And the Lord will do that which has never been done in the first 42 years of your church's existence uh, in spite of how noble this time has been. The Lord performed his fourth miracle, demonstrating that he uses the, my euphemism of the politics of bread. That is, there are some of us that it is not our religion that reveals our politics, but we know now through this last episode that is still ongoing that there was a Herod in the land that has convinced so many of us that our politics have revealed our religion. We have been uh, exposed about what we truly believe, and we've put our faith in man and empire as opposed to the Lord and the kingdom of God. There's one last thing here that we should not miss. And this is very important for the church, for not only did Jesus reveal the hegemonic supremacist practices of empire, but Jesus also revealed the classism that's in religious bodies, and that includes the church this little boy's fish and his bread would have been a barley bread that would have been equivalent to what you and I would know as wonder bread. Some of you don't know anything about that, but some of us do. We know what wonder bread is. And the fish that Jesus had retrieved from the little boy would have been nothing more than in our time a can of salted uh, uh, sardines that many of us would not eat if we could help it. We know that the little boy came from the lowest class structures of his society. Another reason we may not really know his name. But it wasn't until the boy was revealed that he had the resources that the people in the thrones even knew who he was. It was because they needed him and what he had. Otherwise, the people would not have even bothered to recognize his personhood. Oh, Christian, too often we are guilty of dehumanizing people simply because they don't appear to bring anything to our classism table. And often that is a part of every church I've ever had the privilege either to pastor or to stand in. There's always persons in the church that are not certain and aware that there are talented people among them, gifted people, spiritually gifted people who can enhance the mission of the church. Jesus not only told on empire, but Jesus told on the church. And brothers and sisters, I've dropped by to tell us that as you inevitably will, you inevitably will participate in the politics of bread. And you will recognize the power structures of empire and your role to resist, even to abolish them. Don't forget 
that we must also deal and abolish those structures in our churches that could very well disengage, uh, push people away, uh, people who want to be a part of the body of Christ. Well, Jesus, as you know, is the bread of life. And between the sixth and the ninth hour, when the sun refused to shine and the moon turned to blood, they hung that bread up high and stretched him out wide. And in the darkness, we hear him cry, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But it was at that time that all of the church could see that the crucifixion and communion come together because they took a sword and they thrust it into the side of Jesus as though they were breaking the bread of life. And the blood came running, mingling down as the communion wine that would take the table. Jesus blessed it. He broke it. And he give it unto his disciples. And thanks be to God, there's still a fountain filled with blood, drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Sinners are still plunging beneath that flood to lose all of our guilty stains. But when you and I have been there 10,000 years and bright shining as the morning sun, there'll be no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. You can't receive a word like that without there being a response. A response to the way you live, a response to the way you believe, a response to how you offer your life to God. It's in that sacred space this morning that I ask that you join me in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for being our daily bread for loving us so much that you gave yourself for us, for a sinner like me. This Sunday morning, the words that Dr. Evans shared ring true in our heart that God, without crucifixion, there can be no communion. And so God, we ask that you would crucify the things that stand in the way from us being in fellowship and in sweet communion with you. We ask, oh God, for the man or the woman, the boy, the girl, Lord Jesus, the one, O oh God, who has felt you, heard you, but knows, O oh God, that they need to respond to you. That this Sunday, God, might be the day of their salvation. May be the day, God, that they reconnect. Might be the day, God, that they finally turn it over to your hands. God, our desire is not that we would just hear a word and stay the same, but that through your word, O oh God, you might minister to our hearts that we would render ourselves to you, that we would surrender our lives to your hand. So God, as you move, as we feel you move, oh God, help us to not harden our hearts to the movement of your Holy Spirit. For someone, oh God, that means that they know that today is the day they got to make a change. For someone, oh God, this, this is the day of a reset. For someone, oh God, this is the day where we move from living on the margins to living in the abundance of what you have created, Lord. For however you speak to each of us, individually and collectively, we offer ourselves to you in this moment that you might take and transform what has been presented to you, O oh God, and make us more than we could ever hope to imagine. This is our prayer in faith. In Jesus' name, amen. This Sunday morning, as you respond, as the Lord ministers to your heart, won't you reach out to us at Love Lifts at heritagereston.org, lifts at heritagereston.org. Come, let's be one family in Christ Jesus. Come, let's do the work of kingdom building. Come, let's live into the love of the Lord and his joy, which is indeed our strength. Until next time, when we see each other, may the grace of God hover over your lives. May the peace of God buckle you in on every leaning side. May the love of God overtake you and transform the way in which we've been living. Until we meet again, this is our prayer in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us, and please stay connected. Join us for the Hour of Power on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. and daily for morning prayer. Also, subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Have a blessed week.